All right, so think about this. You use the same car for years on end. Airlines will use the same airplane for decades. And yet when it comes to space travel, you use a rocket once and then you throw it away. Well, that needs to change. Let's meet the people who are changing it. The holy grail of rocket science. Getting to space fast, often, and cheaply. One, this has been a long time coming. Booster ignition and liftoff of- For decades, every trip off the planet, extremely expensive. When you build a regular bell nozzle for a rocket engine, it is optimized for a certain altitude. And typically you have a multi-stage rocket. The bell nozzle for the first stage is optimized for the first few thousand feet. The next bell nozzle is optimized for the last few thousand feet before you leave the atmosphere. And then the third stage bell nozzle might be optimized for space. The cast-offs crash into the ocean or end up floating in a zero-G junkyard. That is, until now. My name is Chris Craddock, and I am Rocket Star. Chris started this venture to create single-engine, reusable rockets. I wanted to be the entrepreneur. I wanted to bridge that gap and, and, and get humans into space on a commercial level. Today, we're out here with our friends here at the National Association of Rocketry. We are testing a new type of aerospike engine. The Aerospike was originally designed in the 60s. They're large engines with a lot of thrust. Together with Lee Wooldridge, he's downsizing it for testing. You only have to have one Aerospike nozzle and it will accomplish the same task regardless of the altitude. That's right, one nozzle gets you all the way to space. Not all glamorous doing rocketry. There's two major things that have to happen today. We have to do a actual static fire test, which is where we take the nozzle, put it in the rocket stand and fire it. The other thing is we have to fly it. We test to make sure the rocket works optimally, both from a takeoff and landing, and also from everything on the inside. All the altimeters work, all the computers work as expected. Paper is one thing, computers is one thing. Real world is something different. Ultimately, Chris wants to go big, flying it at Kennedy Space Center. We're getting it ready for when we do our high power test at hopefully KSC and ideally break the speed of sound because then at that point we'll be the first company to ever print a 3D printed aerospike engine and fly it past the speed of sound. I think I'm going to go ask we'll somebody there. about this. A lot going on. Uh, we're a little nervous that things may not turn out the way we want it to. In a way that's good because if things go wrong now, it's better than if things go wrong in front of NASA. Make us look bad. But first things first. We'll be uh, firing it off here in a few minutes to see uh, what kind of thrust and uh, power we get out of that nozzle and that motor combination. This has a uh, force sensor in the bottom of it and it will record the thrust as a, every uh, 10 milliseconds. So you should be with 300 feet back. <laughs> Three, two, one. one. Force profile from the motor looks good. Don't know, I'll have to take it back and analyze it to figure out just how much thrust we got and, and what the, the total impulse was, but, but at least the curve looked good. So it went well. That test went awesome. <laughs> That's Science what's left. Yeah. <laughs> That's beautiful though. We just wanted to make sure that it worked and that you know our specs and data matched up to reality, so. I mean, it, it looks like it's completely just burned up and it's just crap, but I, just, I yeah. love that. It also melted into the case. The average temperature during ignition was over 1,500 degrees Celsius. That's pretty hot to, to, to melt that titanium like that. We thought it would hold up at least long enough for that one second, of, two seconds of burn, but it didn't. They were totally obliterated by the force of the blast from the motor. So we're gonna have to go back to the drawing board and try a new material. We're going to go forward and do a low power test of the rocket with a conventional motor just to make sure that the computer system, the camera system, everything is working properly. Again, we don't do them to be pretty. We do them to make sure that they work. Yeah, and this is a, this is a test. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, sometimes things fail. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm happy for that because I, I would it would have been really embarrassing being at Kennedy Space Center and be like, oh yeah, a rocket blew up. Sorry, uh, we'll be right back. Despite the meltdown, three, two, one. They're going for a launch. 
over 300 meters. I was a little concerned about the launch. No one had ever done this before. Okay, now you can uh, take more pictures. <laughs> the 3D printed titanium nozzles had never been used with this kind of thrust or power or anything. So we had no idea if they were going to make it uh, through the test. The airframe had never been tested. We'd simulated it a few times. We don't know until we actually fly it. In real life, nothing goes as planned. And this was no exception. There I am. Cheers to uh, at least have a 50% success. Hey, hey, you got it in the air. That was happening. The rocket was a glorious success. It flew straight as an arrow, it was very aerodynamic. The parachute that came out, it returned safely within about 10 feet of the launch site. So it couldn't have been better.